Edwards Virginia Smokehouse presents the Cured Meat Podcast. Today's question is, what are some common mistakes when curing a ham? I guess, I mean, there's, there's a litany of things that can go wrong when you're curing a ham. Gee, that, that the details that, that if you don't pay attention to, but, and you can go into the details of how you raise the pig. I mean, uh, I'm not going to go the deep dive on that side so much, but clearly starting with the right breed of pork and the right, um, how you raise the pig has a has an impact. Um, we'll, we've talked about that in the past, but starting, assuming that you're starting with the right pork to begin with, um, the kill date and cut date and arrival of the fresh pork at the right temperature, oftentimes uh, the delivery of that fresh pork, if you're not paying attention to the temperature and how long it's been between the cut date and the arrival of the fresh pork when you put it in salt impacts the, the end result. And you won't know that till you get to the point of sticking the ham to test it. And any kind of temperature abuse or any taking too long to get it to you, we like to get it within three days max of the uh, cut date, um, which would be four days from the kill date, preferably, I mean, I can remember way back when we would kill, cut, and have it the third day, which was the best. I mean, it would just – the freshness made a big impact on, on the end result. So once you got the ham, uh, uh, applying the salt, we like to use an, uh, a flake salt, an alberger flake salt, and really rubbing that salt into the ham. But a, another mistake that some people make is they'll go to a warehouse or to their storage shed and get – uh, whatever salt they're using and it's been stored in a shed that it's 90 degrees outside and they put hot salt on that chilled ham. Well, that's just jacking the temperature up, the surface temperature of the ham. That's a mistake. That's going to cause, uh, again, it's not going to ruin the whole batch necessarily, but it could increase the spoilage rate of that lot of hams that you're using. Uh, applying the salt correctly, which is rubbing the salt in the, on the face of the ham and on the butt end of the ham, and then packing this, the, the ham hock end, if it's a cut end uh, where you've actually cut it past the, the knuckle joint on the leg down to where there's exposed pork, you need to pack the salt in that hock and then pile that salt on top of it before you lay it in salt. Um, and I've seen people get in a hurry and they don't rub it enough and they don't pack the hock. You know, you've heard the term spare the rod, spoil the child, spare the salt, spoil the ham, kind of same concept. Um, so, and, and then five days later, when you, when we resalt, we actually, um, you know, knock that old salt off put a fresh coating of salt on and restack them again uh, with making sure that each layer has a good uh, dose of salt on it. On the first salting, just to back up a little bit, we actually apply sodium nitrate um, on the surface of the ham. We call it the banjo or the face of the ham. So where the H bone is, um, the meaty part on the inside of the hip, um, you just put, uh, we, we apply about three and a half ounces per hundred weight, but it's a pinch, just a pinch of, so, of that sodium nitrate. You keep away from the H bone and you hand rub that, that sodium nitrate in and the, you keep it away from the H bone because if you get too close, it'll cause that meat to dry and it, it'll separate from the H bone, which will cause a crack. And that crack will allow air to get down in it, which will also cause it to spoil. Again, just little details. If you're not paying attention to it, if you get into a hurry, that'll cause a problem. So then the hams have been resalted. And then uh, the other mistake that I think people make is, you know, when in do doubt, leaving in salt longer, which to me makes the hams too salty. Um, I think grading your hams by weight and, you know, hams that weigh, um, you know, we used 17 to 20s, 20, 23s, 23, 26s, three pound weight ranges. And then you figure out how many days you want to leave them in salt. And we have our levels of salt that we like, uh, which we, we try to target four and a half percent when it's done. 
um, in a certain uh, water activity, which normally we target a minimum of 18% shrink uh, in the weight of the ham. Um, but if you leave the ham in salt too long, you can get an 18% shrink, but it's going to be briny salt if you leave it in there too long. And I think if you use the wrong kind of salt, I think there's some salts, I can't explain why. If you use some kind of salts, they just taste, it ends up tasting too salty. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've seen some guys who go, gee, it's Friday and it's two o'clock and we got one more batch of hams we got to wash, but I want to go. It's time to go bass fishing. It's time to go. And they'll say, we'll do it on Monday. And just that extra three days, you come back and you wash those hams or they'll forget they, they miss a batch. And we get first thing, you know, they're a week later and they don't get washed on time and you go to slice them up and, or cook them. And you wonder why they taste salty. It's just paying attention to that time in detail. Also each step of the process there is in our case, we like the salting rooms to be, 38 to 40 degrees. We like equalization to be 50 degrees, 80% humidity. We like the aging rooms to be a certain temperature, 83 to 85 degrees with a 65 to 68% humidity. We really pay attention to that. We don't like to deviate from that because if we do, we know we're going to end up with a different product. So maintaining your, your, your weight ranges of your product, maintaining the same salt, maintaining the temperature ranges, consistently you end up with the same and the same pork uh, that you start with and paying attention to those details every day, you're going to end up with the same product all the time. Yeah. And as Sam said, I mean, the, it really is the devil is in the details from start to finish from the, the farm to the slaughterhouse to us to all the way through. And you know, with uh, our country ham line, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's easier, but it's certainly a little bit more controllable since we're dealing with a more consistent size pig coming in. Uh, yeah. We, we kind of know what to look for on those where it gets a little more challenging is on the Suriano where, you know, none of the small farmers we work with on those are really scaling on property. They're eyeballing the hogs going, ah, she looks about 280, you know, and that's the size hog we want. You get hogs going to slaughter ranging from 250 to 320. So we really have to dial in on the Suriano, as the Sam mentioned, grading those hams out, making sure we're looking at that weight, controlling the salt, controlling the process all the way through. Uh, you know, it's not just a daily check, it's multiple checks every day with a clipboard checking temps, humidities, every single room, all the way throughout the, the entire process. Uh, and that's where I think from the home chef, our you know, chefs trying to do their own or the home, the person trying to do that at home is, is the inability to maintain those consistent temps and humidities throughout the entire process. You know, if they're trying to keep it in their garage fridge, or I've actually mentioned this before, you know, walk-ins, you know, they might try and keep that product all the way back of their, the walk-in in their restaurant. But every time that door opens, you're changing the temp, you're changing the humidity. Uh, so they're not going to be able to get that consistent product all the way through. If people really want to try and work with it at home, Absolutely. We applaud that. We applaud the initiative. We applaud the effort. It's a great little hobby to get into, but just make sure you're doing it right. And actually, uh, Virginia Tech probably has one of the best online resources for the home cure. If they want to see how to cure a ham, so, you know, here's Virginia Tech, how to cure a ham. And it's a step-by-step -step process. It's pretty detailed. Uh, not quite as dare I say, retentive as we are, <laughs> but it will give the home chef, the home cure, the home hobbyist, some great information on what to look for and avoid some of those mistakes that we see, you know, not just uh, in, in the small world of home chefs and restaurants, but, you know, these, these are some errors uh, as Sam's, you know, it could just be laziness or wanting to go bass fishing. You know, I mean, something that simple can actually destroy an entire lot of hams, not necessarily by storage, but a totally different play, flavor profile of what we're looking for, what they're looking for. So devil is in the details. 
You know, one thing I forgot to mention, um, the smoking process, which is really important, uh, it, it normally takes us about a week. Well, on the farm, it may take two or three weeks because you're not smoking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or if you're doing it in a you know homemade smokehouse behind the house. So you're using probably using hickory wood or oak. And a mistake that uh, I can recall my dad and my grandfather talking about is they would put green hickory logs and they'd try to get the, the thick, heavy smoke. And if you weren't careful, you'd get it too hot. So they would always remind me about, you know, when we started this, I mean, I, as a kid, we used to have smoke houses where we had a, a, a 55 gallon drum that we cut half of the ends out of both ends and we threw the green logs in, I threw some, uh, some kerosene on it and you'd light it off. And of course, you know, my thought was, well, I want to get that thing really rolling and they, nope, you want to keep it low and cool as possible you didn't want to get too hot of course the hams were hanging way up in the top of the smokehouse they weren't hanging low but you wanted it to be like a cool smoke and of course now with temperature controlled smokehouses we can maintain 85 and a really thick smoke so if you're doing it at home be careful not to get your fire too hot and if you have access to green uh, sawdust that you can throw on the logs to kind of chill it down. It makes a lot of smoke too. So that's just a tip that would help generate the smoke and keep it cool. Yeah. And for the home care, Sam, I, I'm not sure if you remember, we used to have that group that would uh, get some fresh wigwams from us and do their, they were actually using an old shipping container. It was a retired pastor and a group of his buds out yep. in, Oh, they were just outside of Lynchburg. And, uh, they were actually using an old shipping container as their smokehouse, but they would smoke them. They would get those from us, just the fresh hams from us in late January, early February, uh, and go ahead. They, they 30 days on salt, they would hang them, but they were doing all ambient with screening, but just holes cut in this shipping container. And I actually asked them, I said, you know, how does that go from, from smoking? I know you can kind of keep the temperature cause you're doing it when it's still cold outside. But how about the aging process in a steel shipping container in the summer heat? And he goes, yeah, it gets a little warm in there. You know, so again, <laughs> it's, but the hams were great. He actually brought us some to try one year. And they, they, it was pretty, uh, it, they did a great job with it. And so it, it was, again, even, the, even in no matter what you're working with, as long as you're paying attention to the details, opening up a little bit more airflow on a, it was a 27 foot shipping container. That they were using he said yeah we the one day they forgot and the temp inside got up to like 120 degrees before they like we they, they just opened it up and let it air out for a little while to bring the temp back down but even that was a good vintage of hams for him so as long as you pay attention anything's possible got a cured meat question let us know in the comments below thanks for watching